high-pitched voice that people use to talk to babies. It's nice until you're about five, but it gets old pretty quick. I remember when my primary school teachers would use that voice on me, I would think to myself, I'm seven, not a dog. <laughs> so imagine if everyone for your entire life spoke to you this way. This is the case for six million people around the world. If you have Down syndrome, you are forever treated as a child. Eyes follow you around the grocery store and knowing smiles are sent your way. It doesn't matter how many jobs you've worked, accolades you've won, or children you've raised, you'll always be treated as a child. Why is this behavior seen in Down syndrome, but absent in other disabilities? No one in their wildest dreams would ever go up to Stephen Hawking and baby talk him. What makes Down syndrome unique? To answer all of these questions and many others, I started researching Down syndrome during my freshman year at Stanford University under the mentorship of the revolutionary Professor Craig Heller. I'd always thought that going into disability research would be about promoting inclusion and therefore all disabilities would receive equal opportunities in research. And boy, was I wrong. According to the NIH 2023 report, $1.1 billion was invested into physical disabilities. 894 million invested into visual disabilities. 200 million invested into hearing, but only 133 million into Down syndrome. So why is it that certain disabilities, namely physical and visual, receive significantly more funding than others? There's a hierarchy of disability identified by James Charlson, a founder of the disability rights movement. At the top, are people with physical and visual disabilities. At the middle are people with hearing disabilities. And at the bottom, where people are perceived to have the most difficult lives, are people with intellectual disabilities, like Down syndrome. It's normal, and human even, to pity a person with Down syndrome for having a difficult life. But our pity has unintended consequences. Frederick Nietzsche, who he himself had a physical disability, wrote that pity creates two harms. First, it stops a belief in opportunity. And second, it creates a power imbalance. And so our instinctual pity for people with Down syndrome prevents them from ever being viewed as contributing members of society. And thus, Down syndrome doesn't seem like a cost-efficient investment in research. This makes it really difficult for Down syndrome researchers like myself. Coming up with a hypothesis involves looking at the gaps in what is known. But in the field of Down syndrome, there are no gaps. It's just an endless abyss of unknowns. So instead of targeting Down syndrome directly, I turned towards the adjacent conditions that disproportionately affect Down syndrome, such as Alzheimer's, autism, and depression. What do these conditions have in common? And how can we use the literature on these other conditions to further our understanding of Down syndrome? I stumbled across one molecule in particular, kenoloic acid, discussed in the scientific literature across all conditions. I wanted to know what does kenoloic acid do and how is it metabolized in our bodies? Kenoloic acid is derived from the essential amino acid tryptophan. Interestingly, throughout all four disorders, tryptophan deficiencies are present. Research into Alzheimer's, autism, and depression has shown that increasing tryptophan consumption was able to restore that deficiency and thereby ameliorate symptoms. Now, despite Down syndrome having a documented tryptophan deficiency, this has never before been tested in the entire field of Down syndrome research. So, Dr. Elsa Pataras, my wonderful mentor and I, came up with a question. Can a tryptophan diet restore the autistic-like and depressive-like behaviors, as well as learning and memory impairments associated with Down syndrome? We tested this on a Down syndrome mouse and administered cognitive and behavioral tests before and after a tryptophan diet to see if improvements result. We evaluated autistic-like behaviors by measuring the social interactions between mice. And indeed, after treatment, 
we see an increase in the sociability of mice, indicating a decrease in autistic-like behaviors. We evaluated depressive-like behaviors by measuring the grooming or self-caring behaviors of mice. And indeed, after treatment, we also see an increase in the grooming behaviors, indicating a decrease in depressive-like behaviors. And finally, we evaluated learning and memory by exposing mice to an object they have seen before and one they have never encountered. Mice with good learning and memory will spend more time with the new object because they can already recall the familiar object. And remarkably, after treatment, we see an increase in time spent with the new object, indicating an improvement in learning and memory. These results open the door to a never before seen therapeutic of tryptophan and Down syndrome and a promising non-invasive avenue for clinical trials. As a scientist, these results are incredibly fulfilling. One side of me feels incredibly proud of the progress we've made, but the other side of me questions the implications of our research. If a tryptophan therapeutic has the potential to remove autistic-like traits, is this a good thing? Should autism be removed from Down syndrome? Does our therapeutic make someone's life richer? Or am I in the wrong, claiming my work will help people on this TEDx stage when it is in fact removing a key element of someone's life? Almost all individuals with Down syndrome will develop early onset Alzheimer's within their lifetime. CRISPR, a genetic engineering tool, has shown potential to remove Alzheimer's specific genes. In the future, CRISPR could potentially remove Alzheimer's from Down syndrome. But let's take it one step further. Couldn't we use CRISPR and remove all of Down syndrome? The answer is yes. CRISPR is currently used in a variety of disabilities today, disability research today. And as of 2017, CRISPR has successfully removed Down syndrome and not just in animal model, but in human cells. Is CRISPR saving our loved ones from the disease of Down syndrome? Or are we simply just creating a new person? When is CRISPR ethical? And who decides what we delete from Down syndrome? Is it Alzheimer's, depression, autism, maybe all of Down syndrome? When will our research go too far? And when will I go too far as a researcher? My aunt has Down syndrome and will likely develop Alzheimer's within the next 10 years. Let's say I used CRISPR and deleted her third chromosome. Now, she no longer has Down syndrome, can live completely independently, and has no behavioral or cognitive deficits. She will not develop Alzheimer's within her lifetime. But what exactly has been deleted from her? Is she still kind? Is she still funny? Would she still be a good person? Or would she still be my best friend or just another distant aunt? If we can use modern technology to make anybody's life easier, should we? If we know that being black means you have a harder life, should we make everyone white? If we know that being gay subjects you to hate, should we make everyone straight? Is a disability anything that makes your life harder? Is a disability also a race, sexuality, or religion? What is a disability? Do you remove someone's essence by taking away their disability? When is the loss of a disability a larger loss? Who decides how far we can take gene editing? And what does mankind gain from changing someone's inherent structure. I want to take us to Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. A mad scientist was completely consumed by how he could create life from dead tissues and bones. His creation awoke to life a complete newborn in the world. A new soul was created out of a scientific endeavor. So when we gene edit a person, do we create a new soul? I'd like to leave you with the following questions. Where does the soul live? 
Is it in our tissues and bones? Is it our genes? And if mankind is given the power to perfectly craft a person so that they never experience adversity, should we? Thank you.